Up next in the broadcast, despite North Korea's threat to cancel the upcoming family reunion, South Korea and the United States announced the dates of their annual joint military drills. Snow pounds the nation's east coast while wind chills drop temperatures to frigid levels that will continue throughout the week. And speaking of the ice, will it turn gold for Korean speed skater Mote Bum? The Olympic speed skating champion defends his title in Sochi, Russia. Primetime News begins now. and welcome to Primetime News. It's Monday, February 10th here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I am Yuji Hae. And I'm Sean Lim. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin with the surprise trip of former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Donald Gregg to North Korea, which has been seen as a possible move to secure the release of a captive American. Associated Press Television News reported that Gregg is leading a four-member non-governmental delegation in Pyongyang. Although the reason for his visit has not been disclosed, experts believe he may be in the north to win the release of Kenneth Bay, a Christian missionary who has been held for over a year after being sentenced to 15 years of hard labor on charges of crimes against the state. The hu hu uh, human rights uh, envoy Robert King was initially scheduled to visit Pyongyang this week to negotiate Bay's release, but the North pulled back its invitation, citing the upcoming joint military drills between Seoul and Washington. And speaking of those military exercises between South Korea and the United States, the dates are set. The two sides are to kick off the joint exercises in late February as planned in a move that could affect upcoming cross-border family reunions. Our Unification Ministry correspondent Hwang sung Yi explains. South Korea and the United States will begin their annual joint military drills in the last week of February, a plan that could jeopardize an earlier inter-Korean agreement to resume long-suspended reunions for families separated by the Korean War. The ROK U.S. Combined Forces Command will hold the key resolve exercises and annual defense training drill from February 24th to March 6th. We also plan to hold the Foal Eagle exercises, which also take place every year from February 24th to April 18th. The dates coincide with the upcoming family reunions, scheduled for February 20th to the 25th at North Korea's Mount Kimgang Resort. The Defense Ministry said Pyongyang was informed of the dates on Sunday, but has not yet reacted to the plans. North Korea has, however, previously threatened to scrap the reunions should the South go ahead with the military exercises. We're clearly stating that dialogue and invasive war games can never coexist, nor can reconciliation and conflict. South Korea's unification ministry reiterated Monday the drills involving tens of thousands of troops are defensive in nature and should not disrupt plans for family reunions. We have repeatedly explained that the key resolve exercises are annual defense training drills that will be conducted separately from the family reunion event. The South Korean government thinks the reunions must take place as planned, no matter what. Millions of Koreans were separated from their families during the Korean War more than six decades ago, and some 70,000 South Koreans, most of whom are now in their 80s, are on a waiting list to see their loved ones one last time. Amid the uncertainty, South Korea has been preparing for the reunion event since last week. The Unification Ministry said that although Mount Kumgang saw over one meter of snow over the weekend, snow plows sent by South Korea have already removed most of the snow that's accumulated at the prospective reunion site. Hwang sang -hee, Arirang News. Meanwhile, staying with the North, it appears as though the rogue state is ready to conduct a fourth nuclear test. During the interpolation session at the National Assembly on Monday, South Korean Defense Minister Kim Gun jin told lawmakers that preparations for a test at North Korea's main underground nuclear site in Punggye-ri appear to be complete. The site was used for the regime's third nuclear test last year. Kim also noted that the North is in the early stages of preparing for a long-range missile launch at its Northwest test site in Dongchang-ni. He assured that a South Korean military is keeping a close watch on movements there. 
Now also at the National Assembly, reunification of the Korean Peninsula took center stage. Kim Young ji has more on the heavy debate to implement President Park Geun-hye's policy objectives to unite the two Koreas. On Monday, lawmakers questioned members of President Park Geun-hye's cabinet about the government's reunification policy. Just one month after, the president said a unified Korea would be like hitting the jackpot. Ruling party lawmakers expressed support for the president's efforts, including her vision to create a peace park in the demilitarized zone. I propose setting up a joint committee to establish a world peace park in the DMZ, made up of the two Koreas and the United Nations. This way, the project will engender cooperation from the international community. While welcoming this idea and others, including making reunions of separated families more regular, Unification Minister Yu gil said inter-Korean relations must first improve. Some lawmakers expressed concern that the president's recent rhetoric suggests that Seoul supports a reunification scenario in which the South would absorb the North following an abrupt collapse. But Prime Minister Chung Won said the Park administration does not support reunification by absorption, but rather one that is gradual and based on improved inter-Korean relations. At the hearing, the Democratic Party expressed opposition to the ruling party's North Korea human rights bill, arguing it supports civic groups that routinely send anti-North Korea leaflets. If the bill is approved, North Korea human rights groups will get funding from the South Korean government. This raises fears that anti-North Korea groups will abuse the money taken from the state coffers. To further thaw inter-Korean relations, opposition lawmakers demanded the government lift economic sanctions against Pyongyang that were put in place after the North's sinking of the South Korean warship Chonan in 2010. However, the government said it would be premature to consider lifting the sanctions, known as the May 24th measures. On Tuesday, the National Assembly will resume the interpolation session with a focus on the economy. The nation's biggest personal data leak last month and the government's follow-up measures are expected to dominate the discussions. Kim Yeonji, Arirang News. And a former U.S. point man on Asian affairs had something to say about the development in North Korea's nuclear weapons program. The Christopher Hill, the ex-U.S. ambassador to South Korea, stressed that Pyongyang's possession of nuclear weapons is not acceptable to the standard of the region. Artim Gil has more. Christopher Hill said the road to peace on the Korean Peninsula will be a difficult one, but that stronger relations among Korea, China and Japan could be the key to achieving the goal. I think we could improve the North Korean attitude if we have better coordination and cooperation involving China and Japan. So my hope is that we can do that and that we can have a, a closer understanding of how to proceed in a six-party context. Speaking in an address to the National Assembly on Monday, the former U.S. ambassador to South Korea, who also led the U.S. delegation to the six-party talks on denuclearizing North Korea, also spoke about the prospects for a resumption of the talks. He said that in the event the talks resume, the five parties of South Korea, the U.S., Japan, China and Russia need to agree that Pyongyang not be allowed to have or develop nuclear weapons. The North Korean commitment was to abandon all of its nuclear programs, and for this reason, that has to be the starting point, not the ending point of any subsequent negotiations. Hill also took aims at hardliners in the U.S., who he said seemed to be more interested in criticizing negotiations with North Korea than preventing the North from having nuclear weapons. He said they are actually giving Pyongyang the hope that if they just stick to their guns, they will eventually be allowed to become a nuclear state in Northeast Asia. Mr. Hill said the most important part of any roadmap to peace and reunification for the two Koreas is that they do a lot more talking together. He also said the six-party talks are the best way to kickstart inter-Korean cooperation, describing them as a stepping stone towards reunification. Jim young Arirang News. Before your day ends and another begins, get the latest news live from Seoul. Residents whose features is on the rise. Closing ceremony.
expert analysis from Asia's heartbeat. The legislature, circumstances. With a viewpoint only Korea's global network can provide. The United States, the latest report. Unrivaled access from a team always on standby. It seems President Park Geun-hye is determined to push ahead with her plans to reform the public enterprises that have been under fire for heavy debt and lax management. She warned that any labor attempts to derail her drive to revamp the sector won't be tolerated. Park Ji-won reports. During a meeting of the president's senior secretaries Monday morning, President Park criticized state-owned companies for their lax management and called for reform. She pointed out that a number of public enterprises that are deeply in debt still offer their employees excessive benefits, even covering the tuition at foreign universities for some of their employees' children. She pledged to hold responsible anyone who tries to sabotage the reforms and said she is particularly concerned about recent opposition by unionists at some of the firms. She said the public companies need to regain the public trust by being proactive with their reform plans. President Park also criticized the lack of progress around her ambitious initiative dubbed Government 3.0, which aims to allow for wider public access to government information to ensure that state affairs are more transparent. She said the information is not being shared systematically and ordered fundamental improvements to her plan. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Tougher penalties will be imposed on companies found leaking client data or using it to advance their business. This is the latest measure in the government's response to the largest ever personal information breach that still has many rattled. UDN has the details. The ruling Senate Party and government financial agencies have unveiled a proposal for a set of preventive measures against future data leaks. This SAS nation continues to cope with a fallout from the massive leak of personal information from the country's three major credit card companies last month. The proposed plan strengthens the penalties on financial institutions found guilty of leaking or illegally distributing client information to third parties. Under the plan, those found guilty of leaking information would face up to 10 years in prison or a fine of 470,000 U.S. dollars. That's three years longer and 10 times the amount of the current penalties. In addition, those found guilty of using client data to enhance their business activities would be forced to pay a fine that's equivalent to up to 1% of their net sales. Going forward, financial companies and institutions would be required to delete client data within five years of a client's last transaction. The proposal must now go through the National Assembly, but if passed, will be implemented in the second half of the year. Last month's information leak was the third largest in global history, with 104 million people affected. The leak prompted more than 2.5 million people to cancel cards or have them reissued. Yudian, Arirang News. There are signs that Korea's IT industry is off to a strong start this year. The nation's exports in the information and communications sector rose last month from rising demand for local semiconductors and mobile phones. Our Hwang Jie has the details. Korea's exports of IT products, which include semiconductors and mobile phones, inched up 0.2 percent last month from the same period a year earlier to 13.1 billion U.S. dollars. The trade ministry said Monday that the rise in outbound shipments of IT products came in spite of a weak Japanese yen and financial instability in emerging economies. The trade ministry attributed the rise to growing shipments to ASEAN member countries and the European Union. Shipments of mobile phones in particular surged over 14 percent last month from the previous year to $2.1 billion, a more than 20 percent spike in exports of smartphones led the rise. 
Exports of semiconductors also rose about 15 percent to more than four and a half billion dollars. Shipments of display panels, however, fell more than 15 percent to 2.2 billion dollars as exports to Korea's largest importer, China, plunged. Korea's imports of IT products, meanwhile, dropped 2.7 percent to $6.8 billion, spurring a 3.4 percent gain in the nation's trade surplus. The trade ministry expects the upward trend in IT exports to continue due to the economic recovery in Korea's major exporting markets like the United States and the European Union, along with the growing demand of smart gadgets in emerging economies. Arirang News. Months after Typhoon Haiyan devastated the Philippines, engineers and medics from the Korean military are rebuilding schools and hospitals and offering free medical care to local residents as part of ongoing relief efforts. Kim and Bin sends us this report from Tacloban. This is a cemetery for victims of Typhoon Haiyan in Leyte province. Though some burials are not so formal and are marked, by roadside plots. Large sections of the province were devastated last November when it was struck by what was one of the strongest tropical storms on record, which killed thousands and displaced millions more. For the survivors, there isn't much left, and international aid has poured in. Korea is one of the many countries that have sent relief workers to help the area rebuild. As you know, military engineers and medics chose the name of RAW which means sun and hope in Tagalog, as a reminder of his mission to help the locals reach for a bright future. For now, the raw unit is focused on rebuilding schools and hospitals. They also provide free meals to roughly 500 children, as they have done each day since their arrival in late December. This is one of the hospitals that was rebuilt by the Rao unit. What's even more amazing is that they had it up and running in less than a month. Another step in helping the people here get back on their feet. Apart from the engineers focused on reconstruction, there are dozens of doctors and nurses here giving free medical care to area residents. I just came here for checkup for my baby, for everything is free. Here in Telegrapo, no money, no medication for our illness. Every member of the raw unit is a volunteer who is trying to make a difference in the world. The ARA unit slogan is to become one and complete our mission for the good of humanity. With that in mind, we will give more of our love to the locals before our mission is complete. The unit is providing free medical equipment and health care services to people in the three major districts in Leyte province that were hit the hardest by the typhoon. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News, Takuban. The 2014 Winter Olympic Games has barely begun in Sochi, but we've already seen some new rising stars emerge and even some new Olympic sports. For more on Sochi 2014, our Olympics correspondent Song Ji Sun joins us in the studio. So, Ji Sun, we just saw the 1500 meter short track. It's an event where Team Korea usually shines, but not this time around. Now, out of the three semifinalists, only one Korea made the finals, and Lee Han Bin, who did advance the final, fell short of the earning a medal. In the meantime, Canada's Charles Hamlin won the gold with a time of 2 minutes, 14.985 seconds, followed by Chinese Tian Yu Han. And naturalized Russian skater Victor An, or An Hyun Soo in Korean, won the bronze. The triple gold medalist at Turin in 2006 showed that he's still a top level skater after leaving Korea following conflict with the country's skating governing body and the fellow skaters a few years ago. Mm, that's disappointing, but can we expect some medals from our female squad in the coming days? We should because the female squad had a better day starting with a 3,000 meter relay advancing to the finals clocking the fastest time. And the event will be held on the 18th next Tuesday, so stay tuned for that event. And let's move on to figure skating. I understand there's a strong contender emerging on the ladies' side? Yes, yeah, right, and right from the home. Host nation Russia won the first gold in team figure skating on Sunday, beating out Canada and USA. And Russia's 15-year-old skater Yulia Lipniskaya has risen as a medal favorite 
earning a total of 214 points after free skating on Sunday with a clean performance. So how good is she? Should Kim Yona be worried? Um, not exactly, but there are some points to note here. First off, the first jump starting their programs is the same. Both are triple triples to Lutz and Toe. But in terms of jumps, Kim's triples show bigger scale with longer distance and, of course, higher height. But Lipnitz Kai's jumps are smaller, and she often jumps off on the wrong edge, whereas Kim Yuna always executes exact jumps. But the Russian strength is in her incredible spins, showing off her flexibility. As a former gymnast, her eye spin is almost vertical with her legs lifted up by his, her ear. So in terms of the medal count, where does Korea stand right now and can we expect a medal tonight? Well, unfortunately, Team Korea has earned no medal so far. But uh, let's take a look at the medal standing for other countries for this Monday evening. Team Canada has climbed up to the top spot with its latest gold from the short track just an hour ago, followed by Norway with seven medals overall, and with Netherlands in the third and the U.S. in the fourth place. And as for upcoming medals for Team Korea, the Korean squad may earn its first medal later tonight. Moving on to tonight's events, Korea speed skater Bo Tae-bum returns to defend his title at the Adler Arena Skating Center in the 500 meter. The current number one in the World Cup rankings for the 500 meters finished first in last year's single distance championships held at the same venue. We also have the men's freestyle skiing mogul qualification round in an hour, where Korea's Choi Jae-woo, last year's Rookie of the Year, will be competing for a place on the podium. So stay tuned to catch more of these events and actions tonight, and I'll be back with more stories for you guys tomorrow night. All right, Chi it's going to be a long night. Thank you very much for that update. Good night. And while the world is focusing much of its attention on Sochi, there are other sporting events taking place around the world. Stephen Che joins us with those updates, starting with golf. Well, hey guys, I'm here. The clouds rolled in for the final round of the Pebble Beach National Pro-Am Tournament. But it was still a bright finish for Jimmy Walker, who held on to win it all. He started with a comfortable six-shot lead going into the day, but it came down to a final putt to secure his third win of the season. He sank the five-foot par putt to avoid a playoff and take home the trophy and nearly $1.2 million in prize money. And with the win, Walker now leads in the FedEx Cup point standings after eight events. Now on to world football. Top-class striker Lionel Messi scored twice and helped one in Barcelona's 4-1 victory over Sevilla in Week 23 La Liga action. Well, that alone wouldn't be news, except that his two goals gives him 334 total for Barca, giving him the most goals for a single club in Spanish league history. Messi had struggled since coming back from an injury last month, but seems to have returned to top form with his latest performance. And ending off the Judo Grand Slam Paris took place over the weekend, and Judoka Igu won brought home the gold for South Korea. At the International Judo Federation season opening event, he earned the gold medal in the men's 90 kilo division after his opponent bowed out due to injury. It's the first gold for a Korean in Paris in three years. And that does it for me here in the Sports Center. This has been Stephen Che. I'll be back at midnight for the latest Olympics updates and more. So I'll see you then. The East Coast region saw record high amounts of snow today. For more on extreme weather conditions in that part of the country, we connect live to our Kim Bogyong at the Weather Center. Now, Bogyong, how bad is the situation? Well, guys, from February 6th through today, Timburyong Mountain in Gangwon-do Province had 122 centimeters of snowfall, which is a record. And today, 166 schools in the province canceled classes, and about. 
$560,000 worth of property damage has already been reported. Transportation has been cut off in the mountainous regions of Gangneung and Sokcho in the province, and citizens in those regions have been isolated since last Thursday. More snow is on its way through later tonight. Up to 15 centimeters of snow will fall in the Gangwon-do province and the mountains of Jeju, Ulundo, and Dokdo Island, up to 5 centimeters. Making matters worse, a strong wind watch has been issued in Gangwon-do, so there is a high possibility that the snow may freeze. Taking a look at the current conditions, the nation will gradually be under the influence of a high pressure system from China, which is why we're seeing clear skies across the map. While the snow in the east coast and Jeju will gradually stop by tomorrow afternoon, however, another blast of snow is forecast from this Thursday through Saturday. And other than that, tomorrow the rest of the country will have clear skies. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul reaches 4 degrees while Gwangju peaks at 6. Moving on to other regions, Jeju makes it to 6 degrees while Mount Kumgang tops out at minus 10. Well, that's all for now and back to you guys. Thanks, Po Gyeong. And that's our broadcast on this Monday night. I'm Gigi Hain Sol. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.